Good morning, everybody. I'm here from Children in Scotland with John Finney, MSP, and with the pupils from Wollastone Primary. We're going to do a little bit of talking today with John about Parliament and particularly about equal protection. So I'm going to hand over to Jago now, and he's going to get the questions started. Jago, over to you. I'm Jago, and we think that the equal protection law created and fought for has made Scotland the safer place for children. It is against law for adults to smack or hit each other. So why was it okay for the children to be smacked in the first place? Why did you want to create the smacking ban and did your last job as a policeman influence you? Well, um, good, good questions. Very good questions. It, it will make it will make Scotland a safer place. And um, the uh, I think what we, we have to say is that we learn from experiences. And uh, what I always think is important is that all politicians ha have evidence to support decision making. And uh, uh, there's no doubt that the evidence now tells us that any exposure to violence, however, however minimal, um, could have a negative effect on everyone's upbringing. We'd all have a better life if we, we didn't have to uh, witness some of the violence we see in our TV screens. That's the same when it comes to violence in households. So if you think that at one time it was accepted that a husband could hit their wife, it, for a long time, until about 20 years ago, it was accepted that parents could beat their children with an implement, carpet beater, hit them in the head. That changed. Uh, um, and this final change that uh, the piece of legislation that I uh, helped um, promote and it's important to say this is not about me people have campaigned the children's charities have campaigned uh, for many 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 years and this it's just that i happen to be the politician that uh, took took the issue forward so um all the evidence suggests that it's in effect when it sends a peculiar message to a child Adults should be teaching children. And what does it say? If I was to fall out with Karen, it would, no one would think it would be okay. If Karen and I were having a difference, if I was to strike Karen, people would think that's terrible. So why is it okay for the smallest people in our community eh, it was okay to strike them? So I, I think it's important that we look forward rather than look back. Eh, now, you ask about my, my career as a police officer. A lot of things have changed with the police since I joined the police. I, I joined the police at the first year. I joined the a long, long time ago. And many things have changed. So I'll give you one example that's changed completely is the attitude to um, violence against women and girls in the house. The police intervention in the past was to, just to make sure that there was no disturbance to protect the neighbours. Now a much different approach is taken, and that is that um, it's the police look to see and, and involve other agencies, so health, social work, that, that there isn't some underlying problems and uh, that there isn't going to be problems in the future. So that, that approach in relation to uh, domestic violence uh, um, is something that shows that attitudes can change. It's one of the reasons you have laws. Is to, it's not to fill the courts with people. The reason that, for instance, Seat belts were introduced when I started driving. You didn't have to wear a seat belt, but all the evidence suggests that it's safer for everyone if you wear a seat belt. You know, um, it, it's fairly recently there that people were stopped from smoking in, inside in, uh, in public places, and that's because all the evidence shows that it's damaging. So, um, but the fact that I was a police officer didn't greatly influence, but there are that, that it, it has made me. Um, think that there are a lot of things that I did as a, a police officer in the past that didn't neglect my duty, but things that we would have done in relation to um, violence in the house, in relation to, for instance, gypsy travellers, totally different approaches taken now. And um, we want people to feel safe and people feel safe if they, they think that they're going to be supported and told how to do things differently, rather than if perhaps they're going to be struck. So. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a positive step, and uh, it's one of many changes that are taking place in Scotland to make Scotland a good place for children as well. How did you manage to convince other MSPs to vote for the smacking ban? We read that you won by fifty-five votes. Well, you love you love 
um, looked into the parliament and you'll have seen how the parliament's made up of five parties. And at the end of the day, four of the parties voted to, to, to support it. And that took some, some persuading with some people because what we want to make sure is that the parliament makes laws. We want to make good laws. We don't want to make laws that sort one thing but have another effect. So a lot of people were concerned, that, for instance, that if it wasn't properly put together, that this change in the law, and it's not creating a new law, it's just taking a, a defence away, um, that if it wasn't done properly, that people would feel isolated. So the most important thing was to reassure people that this wasn't about punishing people. This was about a better way of doing things. And um, some people needed more trading than others. It was it was uh, very reassuring. I, I had I had people from all five parties supported my proposal. You have to get 18 MSPs to take it forward. And I did. I had more than that number from all the parties. So at the end of the day, I, I was very pleased that it was a, a convincing victory. I was pleased because it was a decision that was based on evidence, and evidence that shows that it's best to remove any involvement of violence in the house, also in communities. So um, some people needed a bit of persuading that it wasn't going to, to affect people who maybe felt under pressure. And people are under a lot of pressure at the moment, for instance. So one of the important things was to say, well, children's parliament, and they, they, they overwhelmingly supported the, the, the change, and that everything suggested that it wasn't an effective way to, to um, discipline a child anyway. So A, it doesn't work, B, it sends the wrong message, uh, and C, it doesn't respect children. So um, these arguments won the day, um, and, and I'm, I'm very, I'm very pleased. It's important to say that I just happened to be the person that uh, was at the front of the parliamentary campaign. There was a lot of support from children's charities, the Children's Commissioner, Church of Scotland, I had the support of all the medical professions, the police, the social work. They were, they, they all understood that a lot of uh, problems um, that um, people anticipated are matters that have been dealt with anyway. That, you know, police, social work, and health all work together in relation to child welfare issues. So, um, some people needed more persuading than others, but I'm de delighted that it's a, a significant vote in favour. What 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 is why do you think that the Conservative MSPs did, did not support the Equal Protection Bill? Well, I'm. Um, I'm going to try and not give you a politician's answer here, Diego. But um, I think it's for I think it's for the Conservative Party to to, to give you an answer to that. But it, I always want to be fair in things, and um, the the philosophy of that party, the the, the way that, that 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 party thinks is they they think that the state, so government, should have a a small role in people's lives rather than a big role. So they thought that this was interference uh, with families. Now, um, whilst I don't accept that argument, um, because of course the government has a role in providing health, education, and um, um, making communities safe, perhaps by the police and the fire service, I do, whilst I don't accept that argument, I, I would understand that that's their main basis. They felt that people would be um, criminalised as a result of this change in the law. And that's not what the purpose of the change in the law is. I mentioned, for instance, um, seat belts. The idea of people being safer in motor vehicles with seat belts wasn't so that the police would be charging more people, there'd be more people in force. It was to say, look, everything suggests this is a better way of doing it. So um, trying to be fair, I would understand that to be their question. Don't accept it. How does it feel to make Scotland the first country to ban smacking? Well, um, we're actually the, the 58th, um, Caroline. Um, I am the first in the UK, first, and yeah. Wales are on, on their way to doing it, and, uh, and we followed the Republic of Ireland. It actually felt very good. It felt very good. I felt very humbled because um, I keep saying, and this isn't false modesty, that I just dealt with a parliamentary bit of it. All the bringing together to the research all the there was a lot of campaigning went on with um, 
in SPCC children for Bernardo's um, Children's Commissioner and others who um, really wanted to uh, ensure that we were doing our very best for children. And of course, if we do our best for children who are the future of our communities, we're doing the best for our communities too. So yes, it felt very good. Um, um, and um, But it's not about me. I, I, it's just my name that's on the bit of paper. It, it is about what the result means that our communities are going to be safer, our children are going to be treated more appropriately, and better ways of living, um, um, you know, happy, harmonious households. When we were learning about the Scottish Parliament, it gave us a bit of understanding about politics and we would like to ask you some questions about your life as a politician. What motivated you to join the SNP? Well, I, I became in, involved in politics as a teenager when I lived in Oban in Argyll. And um, I um, had always been concerned about, well, I, I became increasingly concerned, <coughs> excuse me, about nuclear weapons. Now, at that time in Argyll, and Ovens in the county of Argyll, on the Holy Loch, the US military were there with nuclear weapons. And um, I was aware that the UK government supported that, and that my view was that there should be no nuclear weapons. That's still my view. And my view was that, although I never ever considered myself uh, British, um, that I, I thought Scotland, an independent country, uh, would be a good way of taking control of our own affairs, but also ridding Scotland of nuclear weapons. So it, it was these two issues coming together. Um, um, and I have to say that would have been 1973, 1974, something like that, um, 73. Um, and uh, I'm still committed to both these causes. I'm still um, I'm delighted that nuclear security bans going to come in. Um, I'm delighted that um, what was seen as a, a, a minority of people supporting independence is now and consistently as being a majority. So these were the two issues that brought me into politics. And then I had a career as a police officer, and part of that was as a, a police federation official. That's like a trade union. And uh, that's about helping people. And I, I like helping people, so I, I then became a councillor. So um, it's it's grown from that. I, I became a, I then became a, a a member of the Scottish Parliament, and uh, I have to say I, I enjoy a lot of things, but what's really most enjoyable is actually helping people. So if someone has a, a problem with their housing, um, I, I might think I'm doing a very fine speech in the Parliament, but what they want me to do is they want me to help them with their housing, They'll help them with their child's education, help them with difficulties they're having with the So it's good to help people. That's how I became involved in politics. and. Uh, um, I would encourage everyone to take an interest in, in public affairs. Um, what made you decide to leave the SNP then go independent and finally join the Green Party? Well, um, it wasn't a decision I, I, I took lightly because I am so against uh, nuclear weapons. And I want to see the world being a safer place. Um, the party that I'd been a member of for about 40 years had decided that it was going to join um, NATO, which is a group of countries, it's called the North Atlantic Peace Organization. Um, and for a number of reasons, I thought that was a bad idea. The arguments had always been that um, after independence, we'd decide important issues like NATO, like the monarchy. Um, and what made that completely different was that um, you sign up to uh, um, an article, and forgive me, I think it's Article 5, that if uh, one member of that group of countries is attacked, then you could then attack the others. And um, an attack in one is an attack in everyone. And uh, NATO is um, what's known as a first right, um, has a first right nuclear policy. So their position would be that an attack would result on a, a potential launch of nuclear weapons. Now, nuclear weapons, a lot of people refer to them as weapons of mass destruction. A, a wise man a number of years ago told me that he likes them to be referred to as weapons of widespread, indiscriminate civilian slaughter. 
because you know about the, you probably know about the nuclear bombs that were dropped at the end of the Second World War in Japan. There are people still suffering, as people continue to suffer as a result of that. So what I try to do, and this is what any organization, I, 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 I say, said I was against this plan. I campaigned to, to, uh, for people to vote against the plan to, to, to join NATO. I spoke at lots of public meetings. I uh, did TV and radio interviews. And um, the, the party conference, which was very democratic, and I, I think the Scottish National Party would congratulate them for having that debate in public, um, voted uh, narrowly in favour of joining NATO. And then I had to um, wrestle with my conscience if I thought that that was uh, an acceptable position. I respect, I respect democracy, I respect decisions. I felt that I couldn't, um, with my conscience, accept that I was working to uh, bring about us joining a, or remaining part of a first strike nuclear alliance. So I um, resigned my membership of the party. And I don't know if we're going to talk about the different um, types of MSP. I was and I am a regionalist MSP. So I wasn't elected on a personal, I was elected in a manifesto. And my clear rationale was, I will honour that manifesto. I will agree to do all the things we said we'd do. Now, you might take from that that I'm suggesting that others had changed the terms by which they were being elected. Um, so that's why I, I, I left and I continued to serve and uh, I had invitations to join other parties. Um, but I, um, I'd always been green with a small g. I'd always been interested in conservation. I'm interested in peace and the mantra of the Scottish Green Party is people, planet, peace. So these are things that you can understand that I was always supportive of. And um, but I, I honoured my commitment um, and stood uh, an independent. I, I, I hadn't been elected for another party, so I, I saw my time as an independent. And then I, I had the, the good fortune to be uh, re-elected, by which time I joined the, the Scottish Green Party. So um, that's a, a wee potted history of uh, how I am where I am at the moment. What were the main things you did while you were an independent MSP? Well, um, th there are lots of um, uh, challenges as an independent MSP because um, if you're part of a bigger group, as you can imagine, you can, um, you can uh, share up the workload. There was no one to share the workload with. I, I joined with two other independent MSPs, my friends and colleagues, and we worked with uh, two then green MSPs, the two, Alison Johnson and Patrick Harvey. Um, I continued to serve on the committees. An equal opportunity committee. I took a particular interest in things like um, domestic violence um, um, and the rights of gypsy travellers um, and also um, human rights generally. So I, at that point, I, I was uh, and uh, remained the, the convener of the cross party group in human rights. I think that it's very important to respect human rights. So I did a range of work, and, and of course, as, as I said earlier, always what's very important to me is serving my constituents and be able to do that. Because it's my experience, people, if they want help, um, they're not bothered what political party you're in, they just want your assistance. So I was pleased that people continued to come to me. People come to members of parliament for different reasons. They come because they've helped their relatives, they come to the come to same part of the world this year, come to the like politics. And I continue to um, do my very best to serve the constituents throughout that, uh, that uh, period. So that's what I did. As a what were your thoughts on the environment before joining the Green Party? Well, I, I was always um, very environmentally minded. Um, my father was uh, a forest worker and then he was a in the latter stages of his life, he was a gardener. So I was brought up in a household where there was a, a lot of respect for nature um, and for the, the environment. My, my father uh, uh, probably would have been a member of the Green Party, I think, if, if it had existed then. He, he certainly maintained a keen interest in what was called the Ecology Party at that time. So I always had that background of just myself. I'd worked in, um, for a 
farm. I worked in the Forestry Commission. Um, I was born and brought up in the countryside. And, um, so I've always been environmentally minded. I, I remember as uh, my time as a councillor opposing a, a major project that everyone was very enthusiastic about and remain enthusiastic about because my concern was that uh, we were going to be building, putting concrete on um, um, agricultural fields that should be growing food. And that still remains my position. And that is about where the, now the University of the Highlands and Islands is placed. So um, similarly, I, I'm a great lover of trees um, and um, my interest in any planning matters that came within my uh, time bordering the Greens was to ensure that environmental impact assessments were, were done and that uh, I campaigned about tree preservation orders in my time. So I'd always get that background. Uh, and the People Planet Peace mantra of the Green Party, the peace bit was covered. Um, I, I'm a member of CND. I may or may not have been at that time. I, I, I don't recall. Um, I oppose the Iraq war. I am um, very keen to promote um, reconciliation and um, peace initiatives. So um, I haven't I haven't moved a great deal in, in, in my political history. And of course, parties share ideas. It's not parties don't have a monopoly on ideas. You know, um, the, there's a number of parties in Scotland that support independence. There's a number of parties in Scotland that support the continuation of the gas and oil extraction. So. In, no one party has a monopoly on ideas, but uh, I, I was always environmentally minded. Small G green um, all my days, I think. What is your main focus in the Green Party at the moment? Main focus at the moment, um, sorry, is um, the legislation that's going through the Justice Party. So at the moment we're dealing with defamation. This is a law that it's a balance of, like a lot of laws, it's a balance. It's a, a balance between people's right to say what they want and people's right to defend their reputation. So that's a piece of legislation we've got now. That's taking a lot of big piece of work we're doing the Justice Committee at the moment. It's about hate crime. And that is uh, a problem in all our communities. But one of the challenges is that in trying to address the issue of hate crime, people being horrible to other people on the basis of race, nationality, religion, disability, gender, whatever, um, is that we don't inhibit free speech. So a number of people are concerned that, for instance, it might impact religious groups in a certain way. So I was looking at the papers just before I came on here on Tuesday, and we are going to be hearing from a number of religious groups, you know, the, the arts, the world of arts, who feel that some of the legislation might impact on how they go about their business. So that's the main work uh, um, at the moment with justice, with um, the Rural Economy Committee, which also I'm a member of. Um, there's a lot of issues around, uh, my concerns about the UK, the United Kingdom, leaving the um, European Union, um, and the implications for food producers in the Highlands, because they're building massive car park in the end to house up to 2,000 lorries. And I don't want lorries that are taking seafood from uh, my communities to France, Spain, to sit in a car park in Kent with all their produce rotting. So that's an interest of mine. Also, we are doing a ferries inquiry into the, the construction, some of the problems around the new ferry, and with suggestions about how to go in the future. I'm also the convener of the Parliament's uh, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing, you know that. And what we're looking at that is some of the implications of the United Kingdom leaving the uh, European Union. and. As with a lot of things, I'm disappointed to say that they've not been engaging with the Scottish authorities in that. So what we don't want to, to lose is our cooperation with these European countries, things like the European arrest warrant, which means if someone is trying to escape justice in Scotland, that a warrant issued in Scotland could be used in any of the other countries and vice versa. And also cooperation between the judicial systems, so the courts and the prosecutors. So I'm very concerned about the implications of that. These, these are the, the main committee issues uh, that I'm dealing with at the moment. We think that children's voices are just as important as adults' voices, and we feel really lucky that we have the chance to talk to you today. We have some other questions we would like to ask you. 
Did anyone inspire you to be who you are today? But I think you get your grounding from your parents and things like the values and the values of respecting other people's opinion. Uh, I was brought up in a household where uh, there was no discrimination and people it's difficult to, to try and explain, but people think differently as time progresses. So maybe some of the ideas that I was surrounded with were seen as being um, conservative, small C, but in, in a household where, you know, for instance, my father had a, a, a real real regard for <clears throat> someone like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, uh, values of public service too were important. I remember um, the, the <clears throat> regard there was in my household for a, for a gentleman called Dr. Christian Varner. Now, he was a South African surgeon who pioneered heart surgery. <clears throat> so things that are very routine now, when I was a boy, were, were major news stories that someone had survived by heart surgery. So I was brought up in a household that, uh, that obviously shaped my views. It's the same with all of us. And views and everything from football teams to food and how to to get on with other people and and uh, so probably my parents are my biggest influence on uh, how I, I, I shape my views and uh, I think there are a lot of inspiring people around the world sometimes people that inspire you ask and disappoint you and um, with how, how they conduct themselves but um someone like Dr. Martin someone like Nelson Mandela these would understand a lot of people would say have uh, shaped their approach, uh, um, particularly Martin Luther King, who would condemn violence and would want to work. And of course, it's very, very easy in life to to get on with people that have the same views as you. The important thing is to try and um, try and reach uh, an accommodation and understand with people that you don't necessarily agree with. Who has supported you most throughout your journey in Parliament? Oh, I, th I think without a doubt, my, my wife. Um, um, I, uh, it's a very odd lifestyle that a parliamentarian has. I would normally leave Inverness on a Monday afternoon or a Monday evening and uh, get the train to Edinburgh, and I wouldn't be back till late on a Thursday night. So, And then, of course, when you are back, people um, understandably expect you to be involved. Um, and because of the, the area that I represent, the Highlands and Islands, everywhere from the very north of Shetland, which is nearer Norway than Inverness, where I'm speaking to you from now, to Danoon, Cowell, which is just across the water from uh, Glasgow, I think. A huge area, so I would often be away. Uh, and um, um, so uh, there's no doubt that my, my wife has been a big support, as she was when I was a, a, a police officer and indeed when I was a councillor, because there's a lot of evening meetings then and uh, Meal times are juggled around things like that. So, uh, biggest support has been uh, my wife. Of course, I've been fortunate to have support and confidence um, in the parliament um, from more than one party. And, and people might think that uh, politicians argue with each other. Um, um, what you see quite often is what I would refer to as theatre. Um, parliament's a lawmaking um, institution, it's a place where we scrutinise public services. and in the committees where the vast majority of the work done, people work very collaboratively together and want to want to make good laws and want to ensure that things come to the very best they can be. What do you think makes a good politician? I think the most important thing is to um, listen, first and foremost, and to um, not think that everything is about scoring points. I think I said to you earlier that uh, a lot of parties share common ground on, on issues. And probably the one thing that uh, um, disappoints me most about uh, politics is that uh, when we work sometimes in private, we don't do a lot of our business in private, in, in the parliamentary committees, we work very collaboratively. We then go into the chamber and some people act like they were sworn enemies. And it's not about that. So. Listening is a very important skill. If I, if I tell you that, for instance, in relation to um, constituency work, my experience um, is that a lot of people come to, to get help because they've not been listened to, not been listened to by the council, by the police, by the education authority. And part of that's sometimes about bureaucracy. 
So the form that, that everyone wants you to fill in for about schools or about health doesn't cover all of the individual case. So listening. But I say to, and this is some a tip my wife gave me, um, if someone comes looking for help, or me or Linda that works in my constituency office, I say to them, I'll do my very best to help you. If I'm not able to help you, I want to be able to tell you why I've been unable to help. And people appreciate that. And sometimes it's because what they're wanting or what their expectations are just can't, can't be met. They're not realistic. Or because things have moved on. But I, I have people who are very grateful to me. And uh, um, at the end of the day, I wasn't able to help, but they appreciated me trying to help. So I think listening is a, is a skill that's... Um, Active listening, so I'm sure maybe that's something your teachers tell you. But I think that's an important goal for our parliamentarian. What do you think is the biggest problem in Scotland that you would like to end or make better? Well, I, I think there are there are a number. There's there's no one issues, but sometimes there are. So I'm I'm very uh, troubled that. We still have poverty in Scotland. And we have poverty in Scotland because some people today are deciding whether to switch the cooker on or switch the lights on because they don't have money. So there's issues around um, the implications of that for the for the individual. For the um, we should have plenty of energy, plenty of energy that doesn't need. So um, that probably um, Aspects that fuel poverty, that 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 cause poverty, and um, probably is one of the biggest concerns. And uh, I, I think, in my party's view, is that if we in Scotland were in charge of our own affairs, we would have different priorities. Because politics is about priorities; it's about decision. What are you going to spend the money on? So, for instance, let me give you one example. Sometimes people say, "Ah, that's all very well that you want to do A, B, and C. How would you pay for that?" And I say, well, straight away, we have 220 uh, billion, and Scotland would get 10% of that under the present arrangements. Um, that's going to be spent in renewing a weapon system, weapon system that couldn't be used, shouldn't be used, and is wasting everyone's money. So, if if we had different priorities, my priorities will always be people. Um, so part of the poverty issue as well that, that concerns me, I, um, I've always a keen interest in housing, back to my time as a councillor as well. We need to have far more houses for people. It's fundamental. Everybody needs to stay somewhere. And by houses, I mean buildings that can become homes, not soulless B&B &B accommodation that some homes become. So a lot of issues around poverty probably are my biggest concern. And of course, the climate emergency, because we have climate emergency breaking down, has biggest impact. Biggest impact is poor people, poor people invariably suffer from poorer health. And they're, they're likely to live in a poorer environment with issues around damp and the quality of their housing. So um, there's so many issues games together that land that uh, that's a wee resume of some of them. How has COVID affected you? Well, I, I think like everyone else, um, um, it's, it's had a big effect. Um, it's not had effect on my personal well-being. I'm fortunate. I'm in a, a warm house. I've, I've got food. I, I can go out and exercise in a, a, a nice part of the world. Um, the biggest impact is if I tell you that as a, a member of the Scottish Parliament, I've been in the Parliament once in the smart. Now, um, I spoke in a debate yesterday. I spoke in the stage one debate on defamation. I spoke the day before uh, in a members' debate about guardianship, about support for uh, unaccompanied children in Scotland. So I can do all the work of a parliamentarian, but the biggest difference is that um, it's um, I'm not travelling to Edinburgh. Um, and uh, the other aspect of that is that, of course, I'm, we, we, our office is closed because it's not safe to be open. So we're not able to have personal callers, um, people call past. But um, I get still get hundreds of emails, get lots of phone calls, lots of messages um, by all the different routes. 
But that's the biggest difference. Um, that we, we are not able to have direct contact with the public um, because it, it, the challenges of that. But we provide, hopefully, a very good service. Before you retire, are there any last things you would like to achieve? Well, there's there's not very much time to uh, uh, achieve things. Um, legislation takes a long time. I, I would like um, to uh, ensure that the hate crime bill goes through because uh, although there's a, there's some understandable concerns about it, I think we want to send a very clear signal to people. And you'll understand that it's not a middle-aged um, white man that gets abuse. Uh, um, it's, it's often uh, people from all the have very unpleasant lives as a result of the hate crime which affects all our communities. So I like that legislation to, to, to get through. There's a lot of other um, pieces of legislation. I would like there to be some clarity. I've been pushing very hard to get a UK government minister to come to the Rural Economy Committee so as I can ask questions about our farming and fishing communities. Um, and um, They've not been helpful. Let me not put it strong on that. They've not been helpful. So I'd like to have some clarity for the decisions on that. These would be the probably, um, and I would I would hope as well before uh, the end of term to still continue to provide a good service. It's it's only up until March because after that you, you're no longer an MSP. Uh, you can only deal with existing work. But there's who knows what will happen between them. Um, now and then, um, but there's plenty of work to be doing, doing and uh, I'm very keen to work with others to, to ensure that the bit of a rush of legislation that we have at the end of any um, parliamentary term, that it's good laws that are made. What might you do after you retire? I'm going to go and see my grandchildren, <clears throat> excuse me, um, after I retire. They live in Catalonia, um, meantime in the north of Spain, and uh, I've not been able to see them for a year. So I'm, I'm very anxious to, to, to go and visit them. Um, and uh, I've, I've no plans. Um, I've, uh, I've worked since I was a teenager, and uh, I, I don't suppose I'll do nothing, but I've no plans to do anything immediately other than uh, get away with Mrs. Finney on a holiday and uh, see um, my grandchildren. And obviously, their mum and dad as well. But, uh, yeah, that's that's the main aim. No plans beyond that at this point. There you go. If there was one thing in the world that you would like to change, what would it be? I would like to see everyone on the planet um, have healthy lives, have enough to to live by, and to stop destroying our planet. These things would all link together. And if we did that, there would be rest reasons for conflict. Um, and because in the past, there's been disputes about oil and gas reserves. Um, there's been wars about oil. With the climate emergency, unless we do something radical very soon, and that is stop burning fossil fuel, then we're going to uh, see disputes about food. And food disputes about water, and these disputes are going to lead people um, migrating. Mass migration might be an issue. So um, one thing I would like to see is everyone properly fed and healthy. And if that, that, that would be a good start. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Can I thank you all very much indeed for your questions? Excellent questions. And uh, I think there's a few budding journalists in, among you there. Uh, did you put them together yourselves or did you work with the class to do that? Um, we put them together. We, we did them miss ourselves with Mrs. Robertson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well done, Mrs. Robertson, helping you along with that. That's very good. And uh, I'm pleased that uh, the one thing I wanted to say about the Parliament is um, the Parliament isn't a, a fancy building for fancy folk. The Parliament's your Parliament. And I don't know if you've been able to visit yet, but hopefully you will visit. Um, that's what I like about the Parliament. It's a place where at night of meetings with all sorts of things. It's important that uh, people uh, uh, participate in democracy and, uh, and understand that that's your building. It's not. Thank you. 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 Thank
some sort of fancy place that uh, isn't accessible, it's got to be accessible for the public um, to be meaningful. Thanks very much for your question. And I'm sorry I'm squinting through it. That's, that's a rare bit of Inverness sun there. Lucky you. <laughs> Our, our, our sky seems to be quite dull. Yeah. About guinea. <laughs> At least it's not raining though. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm assuming that you don't spend every Friday interviewing politicians. What What is it you're missing, if missing is the right word? Um, uh, I think we're missing maths just now. Oh, right. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we're missing break. And our maths. We miss both. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed for your question. I don't know if uh, is Karen going to rejoin us. Or... I am. I am actually here, but uh, fortunately, if anybody's camera was going to fail, um, it's mine. So that that's actually good news. I'd rather mine went out than yours went out. So the only way I can restart it is by rebooting my computer, and I definitely wasn't going to do that in the middle of your conversation. So I'm still here. I've been uh, loving listening along and and learning all about everything you've been saying, John, and, and seeing you all asking your questions. So. I'm going to say thank you from Children's Scotland to all of you, especially to Wollaston, to Mrs Robertson and the others that are hiding in the background there. So thank you especially to you as pupils for giving up your, your maths and your break. I, I hope you're going to get it afterwards. Yes, they will. Um, <laughs> well, you've got, it, you've got it on camera now, so they've promised you a break, so you have to get it. So. <laughs> But we'll say thank you to all of you. Um, I hope you have a lovely rest of your Friday and John, big day tomorrow. Um, and I hope you enjoy your retirement and, and fingers crossed your tip, trip to Spain when it comes around, when it's safe. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone uh, at Children's Scotland and to Wollaston pupils and staff. Thanks for your time. That's perfect. Okay, I'm Best going to stop, stop recording now. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.